You can't trust people, uh, but you can trust code, uh, or at least you can trust code more. I think members of the public, certainly, they don't even know that this happened, but members of the crypto community largely uh, aren't taking this seriously enough. This is absolutely a do or die moment for the relationship between the network and the state. And I'll get into that a little bit more, but I, it's, there is a, there is a level of technical innocence or less charitably ignorance so that people need to understand the average person has, right? What is happening now is what happened and destroyed the spirit of the original web. The challenge here is everybody knows who you know is technically involved in this, that, that Bitcoin is really bad on privacy. I think the only people who do it worse actually are Ethereum. I mean, that's because they use the account-based model as opposed to the address-based model. But a lot of people only use one account. So they see it, it's as if you were using Bitcoin, you were just reusing the same wallet. You get this giant history Croft that just follows you wherever and then you create all these chain explorers and then people see every smart contract you've interacted with on Ethereum and it's just it's problematic. Coin suffers from the same thing but at least largely because there's not as much contract based activity on they they only see address A sends to address B and so on followed out they chart it they see where it splits on the chain and then they try to go where it goes back to a common node or they track spends or they go where it goes through KYC gateways and they find out it with the tools that I had at the NSA in like 2013, tracking Bitcoin transactions would have been very easy. And this is why, even though I used Bitcoin to rent the servers that I used for communicating with journalists and passing massive archive files over the internet anonymously, I was using Tor, I was using mixing services, I was trying to basically do anything that would buy time. It wasn't that I thought the NSA wouldn't be able to follow the trick. It was that I'd have to go to this guy and then I'd get routed over to the office and then they wait on it because they had other things to do. And it wasn't until there would be a sustained effort that they would be able to do this. And by then I would have always already contacted the journalists so the door would be closed. Normal Bitcoin users don't have that level of awareness. They don't understand the network flows. They don't understand simply your IP address sending this transaction to this node that then passes it on. All of that leaves a history that is largely being recorded. There are ways on Bitcoin that they can improve this and that are like coin join transactions and the whole join market thing, which are great, but they're way too technical for average people. We see some wallet providers who are trying to like build in their own mixers and like that, that's great. It's an improvement, but it's really not enough. You have to have this stuff in the protocol. It has to happen on chain. And that's where you see things like, yeah, Monero is great. I use Monero. People think I'm like a super Monero hater and no, it's they've got a couple super toxic people in their community and there were some bad design decisions like a million years ago and it's not perfect right but, but what is uh, zcash has its own flaws too and then zcash is also great for a lot of people they're not using the shield of transactions or at least they weren't using the shield of transactions now it's getting easier they've got mobile clients that will actually you'll do a transparent transaction and then it'll roll you over to a shielded transaction automatically and these things are great this is what we need though we need people to be able to transact on chain at any time and effortlessly without their awareness, the same way that when you connect to email through a web browser, it's using HTTPS, you should have levels of privacy protection baked into the protocol. And this prevents the kind of tomfoolery that we see the US government beginning to engage in with things like OFAC and Tornado Cash. I, I think members of the public certainly they don't even know that this happened but members of the crypto community largely aren't taking this seriously enough this is absolutely a do or die moment for the relationship between the network and the state and i'll get into that a little bit more but I, it's there is a there is a level of technical innocence or less charitably ignorance that people need to understand the average person has, right? What is happening now is what happened and destroyed the spirit of the original web. I think a lot of people who are in this room, they've been technical for a very long time. They've been a part of the internet for a very long time. They've seen it change. A lot of you in the room remember what dial-up modems sound, right? That's not actually shared by the vast majority of the population, even people who are of the right age. We lost that internet because we onboarded billions of people and the people who were providing the gateways for that didn't have their best interests at heart.
that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing people exploiting the kind of ignorance that made so many people now think tapping like the Facebook app on your phone, that's the internet as they understand it. And now think crypto is Coinbase, right? Or something else <laughs> equally horrible as that. And to you, those of you in the room who are work for Coinbase, it, it's really nothing personal. You're just an example of a, a sort of overly compliant, overly indulgent sort of thinking, which, yeah, you guys still get rich, you'll make a lot of money, but have you actually advanced the interests of society? Uh, maybe in the same way that people sell lawnmowers do. You're not even building lawnmowers, you're selling them. Great, you've popularized the lawn. Lawnmowers are important, they're valuable, right? But when I go and buy a lawnmower, nobody asks for me to hold up my passport and scan my face. And the fact that you guys go along with that is frankly toxic and embarrassing. You can't trust people. People, but you can trust code, or at least you can trust code more. Let me get back on the, the tornado cash thing, because that's where all of this gets complex and interesting. Uh, what you just said, where like the big players will become the sizable entities in the field, we know that works. That's simply a season of scale. It's going to happen here. My plea to those of you who are in that big end of the pool is if you're going to pay cave strategically, leave space for the protocol and for the sort of values that we're all supposed to be representing here to make sure that, yeah, the government wants to do something and they can layer some law on you because you're big and you've got 10 million employees and they can all come and arrest you. But make sure that, yeah, if you are a stub uh, and you have to check passports and you have to identify wallets to go one hop out, you understand and you structure your systems in such a way and everyone understands. That's fine, but as soon as somebody goes one more hop out to the second hop, they move to the other wallet, your trail goes cold. And when it comes back into your exchange, you have to ask people what their purposes are. They declare this, whatever, but you really have no way of checking it. And you don't want to be in a position where you can check that because really that's not your role in society, even the government says it is. That's for police. That's for intelligence, right? That's their job. And their job is supposed to be hard. Don't make their lives easier. There's this whole mindset in government and this argument for everybody who's been following cryptography we know about going dark they're like oh we want to peel back whatsapp's encryption we want to make sure that apple doesn't turn on end-to-end -end encryption we want to make sure they push all their crap to the iCloud in unencrypted backups or backups to which apple has the keys the police can request them or weak keys the police can crack them and every time apple gets close to doing that uh they go and complain and they go well, we're going to cause problems we're going to pass a law if you do this so so Apple caves, they re-engineer things to make it problematic again. Understand the difference between their job and their role in society and your job. The job of policing is supposed to be hard because if it's not, we live in a police state. We don't want everything we do to be scrutinized. We don't want every transaction to be monitored. We don't want to show our passports to uh, do lawnmowers. And the government has more power and more capability now than they ever have at any point in history. Do not be charitable. Do not be generous to them. They don't need more help. They don't need more tools. They don't need more weapons. They have enough and they're reorganizing society to itself be a weapon. Which brings us back to Tornado Cash. There are actually, I would like to believe, well-intentioned people in this space. In the US, actually, this is where we give the Coinbase type people props. The ones who've been pouring money into lobbying in Congress have actually won some proponents here who say, don't do this, it's not good for the United States. We've seen the Fed governors, Waller, I think, say they're not interested in it, it's not good, it's not useful. Some other ones as well. Uh, and this is very promising, right? Because we don't need, we don't need it. It doesn't, it causes problems, but it doesn't solve any problems. It, it leaves people from the, the tribe that believe human privacy is a human right. And believe sound money uh, is a desirable property. Because yeah, once a government can reach every unit of currency in every place, rather than it being a pocket in a pocket or hidden under a mattress where they can't reach it, it's better that we make sure there are some limits on their capability, make sure there's some limits on their reach. But in, in terms of where that goes, what that does, how we respond to it. I think the core point is to ensure any place that we see these, they should be convertible. The interesting thing about China's version of this is that they have a largely closed economy. 
right? Uh, there's investment and cross listing. You, you can't freely convert the Chinese yen run to like the US dollar and back and forth without a lot of red tape. And so that makes it easier for them to do this. They are hyper authoritarian to the point of being increasingly totalitarian. People aren't using physical cash as much. They're using their social media ID to have their own wallet and do all of uh, their transactions. It's in every store. They're being photographed as they come and go. It's a privacy nightmare. The thing is, if you move to one step out, right, for example, the Russian economy, cryptocurrency for payments are forbidden, at least domestically. Internationally, they talk about beginning to legalize it because of obviously sanctions and everything like that. But it's, it's not really clear. There's a lot of sophisticated, deep thinking happening in the Russian government, which is probably not surprising to a lot of people on this topic. But there is like a gray market thing here where Russia has 50 different PayPal equivalents, right? And there are third party services that will take your Bitcoin or your Monero or whatever, and then they'll send the money that they change from that into your wallet for this. And then you can change that back and forth. So you could take money, uh, send it to a third party gray market kind of middleman, turn that into US dollar coin or tether or whatever. And uh, basically you can move in and out of the economy. That way you can make payments more privately in a weird way in Russia than you could in a lot of places because of that gray market space. Now, obviously, as things get more complex, as they get more regulated, like we're going to see that change and adapt and evolve. But I think we're going to see a schism here where we see governments develop in one of two directions. They are going to be either in this very Russian pioneering sense, I and mean, I'm not trying to impose a value judgment there. I'm just saying it's very oh, wild and frontiersy there. There's a lot of freelancing and the law is less clear. So you see a lot of experimentation. And then the China direction where everything is gated, everything is watched, everything is permission. And what I want to put people on watch for is when we get back to Ethereum again and this whole OFAC thing, the idea of OFAC compliance being desirable or being something that you want to do. If you're Coinbase and you're just passing things in and out, that's one thing. If you're Coinbase and you're running validators, that's a very different, very dangerous thing. You guys shouldn't be running validators because you can't defend the values that you should be promoting to your customer by doing so. And a lot of people aren't going to like that because they're like, we've got 10 trillion Ethereum uh, in deposits. You got to loan that out to somebody who can actually do something good for the world with it, as opposed to doing it for yourself under these regulations where you're doing a sort of blacklisting on it. What I'm talking about, for those of you who are less familiar, is the censorship problem on the Ethereum blockchain right now. Since they moved from proof of work to proof of stake, I have wrote about this actually many years ago, but I got it wrong. I said proof of work basically creates a lot of problems in one direction, waste of energy, e-waste and things like that. Sure, we understand it. Uh, we're running a giant math contest and the only prize is the next block, uh, the block reward from that. But on the other hand, when you move to proof of stake, you bypass all of that wasted effort, but you have then entrenched a system in which the rich get richer. So which of these is more desirable? Then when we go, the people who are rich have much more to lose from breaking the rules that you actually you start to create an inevitably more centralized network over time. And this is a big problem. Now, this is a major experiment. It's very interesting. I think the proof of stake thing on Ethereum is great and it's something we want to see succeed. But this centralization thing we haven't dealt with and OFAC has really pounced on this. Earlier today, I checked um, MEV Watch. If you look it up, it's a site that goes how many blocks of the last day or week or month or whatever are censored on the Ethereum network. Today, it was 53%. And I read a headline for somebody that says that it spiked as high as 63%. Think about that. If two thirds of a blockchain's transactions are censored, that's a fail state. At, at that point, you might as well be using PayPal. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that because I hate PayPal uh, and I love Ethereum, but everyone involved in the Ethereum ecosystem needs to understand that this is an existential threat to the project. This is what I mean by do or die moment. Uh, if 2% of transactions are censored, okay, sure, you just wait for the next block. But if one idiot sitting behind a desk 
in Washington can stamp a piece of paper without so much as passing a law. And in a few months, every other block in your network or two out of three on your network, and it's still creeping up. So it's going to be eight out of 10. Every block in your network is getting stopped and frisked. You're the opposite of decentralized. And if you think that this thing with tornado cash is the last paper that somebody in Washington is going to stamp, you're going to have a very bad time over the next decade. So I think the right move here is for people involved in these kind of projects, for people running validators, for people working on protocols, for people working the KYC gateways, is to say, look, if Washington wants to tr censor transactions, you are more than welcome to on your own validators. You can buy your own ETH, you can stake it on your own nodes, and you can censor to your little heart's delight, but you are not the king of the end. I would argue that, quite frankly, they're beginning to look more like the enemy of it, and Ethereum shouldn't be a part of that.